preaching today. It's going to be a good day. Hey, man. Well, hey, welcome to Journey Church today uh, on the last Sunday of 2018. And uh, I just, how many people believe that God saves the best for last? Amen. I believe that that's going to be true about today. I believe he saved the best for last, and I'm excited for God's plans. I feel like I've got a word that is going to transition you into 2019 and is going to prepare you for success. You're going to experience God in a way you've never experienced him before. But before we do that, I want to uh, let you know about some of the things that are happening at our church because um, I think they pertain to you today being one of those things. Today, right after the worship experience, we are going to have baptisms and it's a, I, I just think it's a special step for a lot of people. Uh, baptism is, uh, the way I like to explain it, it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, like a wedding band doesn't make you married. It just tells everyone that you are. It's a public declaration. Like, don't touch me. I belong to somebody. And, um, and, I, and I really feel like baptism is the wedding band of salvation. It's what we tell the world. It's what we tell the devil. Sorry, I'm his. <laughs> I'm taken, I've given my life, and it belongs to him and no one else. And so if you are interested in taking that next step today, we've got clothes for you. We've got towels for you. Um, If you haven't washed your hair, you want to do two at one time, we've got shampoo. (laughs) You can do it. Just we'll go down, we'll scrub a dub-dub, and you come back up, come out clean on the inside and the outside. We'll help you out. We just want to maximize your time here. And so we won't do that. But um, some people say first time at church, they don't know when I'm joking, when I'm serious. And so I'm joking. Um, but we do have all those other things for you. And uh, here's a great praise report. If you've been with our church since the beginning, raise your hand if you've been here at least two years. Come on. Raise your hand if it's two years. Yeah, that's the beginning because we're only a church that's two years old. And, um, and uh, I think it's so cool today, depending on how many people raise their hands and go to the back. How about this? We're going to baptize more people today than we baptized all of 2017 together. All of 2017 together. God's doing something. How about this? You want to hear something pretty cool? Say yes. Yes. I met a couple in the lobby who um, lives in Atlanta and drove six and a half hours to come to church this morning. (laughs) To come to Journey Church. So don't at me if you live in Kissimmee, okay? <laughs> don't even try me, all right? So I thought, I thought they were here for more than that. I was like, okay, but you got Disney tickets, right? i like, what else, what else are you here for? And they were just like, no, the only reason. At 3 in the morning, we got in our car, and um, we drove. We just felt like the, I said, how did you even hear about us? They said, well, I knew somebody who lived in Florida who shared a, a clip of your sermon on Facebook. That's why it matters when you do those things. And, and, and it's our first time getting introduced to the ministry and to the church. And so we got in our car at 3 a.m., drove down. We didn't know why. We didn't know why we needed to be here. And then right before worship, he came up to me and said, oh, you guys are doing baptisms today? He's going to get baptized today after the end of the worship experience. Come on. God is good. Got chills. It's going to be a good Sunday. God's going to do something special today. I really feel it. Um, I also want to let you know that starting on January 6th, everybody say next Sunday, Sunday. we're starting a brand new sermon series called Uphill Habits, Uphill Habits, and um, I've got a better way for you. If you're in the resolution camp, if you are a New Year's resolution type of person, let me save you the trouble. They don't work. If you really want to see change, hear me out, form new habits, forget resolutions, form new habits, and if you form a new habit, here's what I know about your habit, your habit will form you. It'll form a new you, okay? And so get around some good habits. Get those developing in your life. And so we're, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you four habits starting in January. Four habits that are absolutely going to set you up for success, uh, and it's, it's going to be great. You don't want to miss one Sunday in January. And then uh, lastly, January seventh. Everybody say January seventh. Yeah, that's a Monday, okay? It's the, not this Monday, not tomorrow, but it's the Monday after. And uh, we're going to kick off our 21 days of prayer and fasting. 21 days of prayer and fasting. Yeah. If you're new to our church, this is something we do twice a year. We do this in January. We do this in August. In January, it's called prayer and fasting. And in August, it's called prayer and feasting. Come on, somebody. Okay? I can't fast two times in the year. All right? Uh, I die. Okay? So I don't have many reserves on me. So when I fast, I don't burn calories. I burn marrow. All right? Just, I just don't have, don't, don't have the reserves. 
okay? So, um, but uh, hey, I actually want to, I went through my email inbox. I wanted to pull some, you know, some testimonies from this last year's fast. And there was honestly so many um, that I couldn't, I, I couldn't pick one to share. But maybe you could just testify with me today if you're here in this church. If, if you under, because we got people who've never experienced it. If you've experienced the power of praying and fasting in your life, will you make some type of noise or signal, let people know? It's powerful. If, you, if you've never experienced before or done it before, uh, it's powerful. It'll really change your life. And I got to be honest, that's kind of my, uh, my outcome, my goal today. I want to encourage you. I want to uplift you, whether you decide to fast or not. But I think it's a win if at the end of today, two things. You either get baptized. If you've never been baptized before, we'd love, we're ready for you. But two, you would decide a week from now uh, to, to go on this fast with us. And so we're also going to gather um, in, uh, at different churches around the city every Wednesday night. Uh, for prayer as well. We'll have a one-hour prayer service too. So um, it's, it's special. It's special. And to, and to show you a little bit about what I mean about the power of fasting, I want to invite you to turn to your Bible. Uh, open up to the book of Mark, uh, chapter 9. We're going to read verse 14 through 29. And if you have it, uh, it there, that's cool. If you don't, we'll have it on the screen for you, so no worries. You can follow along uh, with us. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 29, we see the power of fasting here. When they came to the other disciple, they being Jesus and his three uh, peoples, like Peter, James, and John, those are the three he always rolled with. And so uh, when they, those three and Jesus, came to the other uh, nine disciples, they saw a large crowd around those disciples and the teachers of the law arguing with them. What are you arguing with them about, Jesus asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you. Brought who? You, Jesus. I brought you, Jesus, my son, who is possessed by a spirit and that has robbed him of speech. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Now, please notice the change of the subject word from verse uh, 17, 16 to verse 18. In verse 17, he says, I brought him to you. But in verse 18, the subject shifts from Jesus to the disciples, which tells me that although this man had good intentions, he had, he had the wrong, uh, he was placing his trust in the wrong thing. He went to what looked like Jesus, but it was actually people. This is where he made the first mistake. Never put an expectation on people that only God can fulfill. He went to the people expecting God to do something to the people when God said, I wasn't even invited to the party. I wasn't even here. And so don't blame God for what God's not invited to. Okay? Uh, Verse, verse, that's not my sermon, but I hope it'll help. Verse 21, Jesus asked the boys, uh, asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if, somebody say if, you can do anything, somebody say anything, Take pity on us and help us. And Jesus responds. I love verse 23. Come on. If, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. And don't let the poetry of the moment skip out on you. Because the man asked Jesus if, so Jesus flipped the if on him. If me, how about if you? And then the man started with anything, and Jesus responded with everything which is a word for somebody because I think that there are some areas in your life that you've circled that you said, okay, God can help this area of my life, but he's not going to be able to touch this area. He can do that, but he can't do this. And I just want you to know that he's an everything God. If it's there, he can touch it. He can change it. He can heal it. He can free it. He can deliver it. He can break it. He can set it free. He can heal it. He can restore it. He can elevate it. He can advance it. If it's there, he's got something for it. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. The impure spirit, You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter into him again. That's the kind of freedom God wants you to have, by the way. Not a February freedom or a March freedom. He wants a freedom that you never have to go back into what you were in again. It's not going to be like 2018, guys. You were free for a minute and then went back. And God says, that's not my freedom. My freedom here, never again. That's the kind of thing God wants for your life. I really believe that. Verse 26, the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, 
Why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we do it? Verse 29, he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. In other words, the disciples were saying, this isn't working. That's the title of today's talk. This isn't working. I wonder if there's anybody here today who there's something in your life that's not working the way it should or the way you thought it would. Um, I got to be honest, in our marriage, listen, I, we, we have, that's probably our shared pet peeve. And I don't know if you're with me on this, but I hate when things that I paid for are not working. Are you with me? You know, like um, there's a couple things in my life that are like that. I have a microwave that at one point was not working. Um, I mean, it did work, but uh, the number five <laughs> it didn't work. And the stop clear button, you know, the stop clear button that when you make a mistake, it didn't work. And so oftentimes the kids would put, we'd say the kids to put something in for two minutes and they put 20 minutes, just hitting zero. I couldn't even clear it. I would have to let the microwave run for 20 minutes in order for it to get back to zero to put in something that I actually needed. It was frustrating. Um, I got this really cool lock on the front of my door. It's a, a Bluetooth wireless uh, Wi-Fi lock. Like I can actually unlock the lock with my phone from anywhere in the world. I think that's awesome, but it don't work. It don't, it don't work. That's the problem. I got a dishwasher. Now the dishwasher actually works, but it, the, the problem is that it, it didn't break. The problem is that my kids broke it. And I, they were helping us out by putting the dishes in the dishwasher, but nobody told them that they had to rinse off the dish before they put it in the dishwasher. So it, it started pouring out and then we opened it up and we found in the filter there was a bunch of food. And so that stopped working. And then I got a sprinklers. You know, I got a lot, I got a lot of grass and we just installed grass and we got sprinklers. Uh, but for three years, uh, my sprinklers didn't sprinkle. And so I got sprinklers that won't sprinkle. And um, it just gets frustrating. You know, but those aren't the only things breaking in my life. You know, I also, uh, my kids, I got a bunch of toys from the dollar store. And they know, they know the story with dollar store toys, by the way. Like, if you go up to them and you say, what do you think about dollar to toy, uh, store toys? They would tell you. They'd be like, they're great, but they always break. <laughs> they just know it, you know. And they got a lot of those on Christmas. Like, I'm grateful for my family and for my friends who bless them with presents. But, you know, you got people who really love your kids. They're going to buy their toys at Target. <laughs> and then you got everybody else who just knows you. But they want to make sure that you know that they know you. And then they get your kid a toy from dollar store. I'm not hating on it. I'm just saying that it breaks. And my point really is that I'm not upset when a dollar store toy breaks because I didn't spend a lot of money on that dollar store toy. What I get upset about is when things break in my life that I've invested a lot in. My frustration is not with the thing coming apart. My frustration is that I've already invested so much into this thing. And so now what does that mean about my entire investment? If you haven't caught on yet, I'm not talking about appliances. You know, it takes a lot of courage to admit when something isn't working. Like, it takes a lot of courage to admit when a relationship isn't working. Even though you've invested a lot of time into that person, years maybe, tears maybe, when your son or daughter isn't living the life that you thought they would live and you've invested so much into them over that time, it can be frustrating when it's not working the way you thought that it would because you've invested so much. Um, it can be frustrating when like prayer or God, you've been in church your entire life, but it just seems like, like those things, like it isn't working um, uh, anymore. And I gotta be honest, I'm sad that you're experiencing that, but I'm glad that you're finally at that place because it isn't until you get to that place that you're ready and willing to make a change in what's going on in your life. Even to get to there is really a journey, right? Because I've noticed with the appliances, like I don't get to that place right away. There's usually three other places I'm at or two other places I'm at right before that. Like the first phase is always denial. Right? Like I also have a sink in my house that for whatever reason leaks, but the faucet's off. And it leaks right at the base where like the sink meets the counter. And so one morning I woke up, I went down and it was like a puddle around my sink. And I'm like, man, you know, my list is like the sink is broken. I'm like, I don't want to believe that. <laughs> I was like, it's not broken. It's crying. You know, I don't know. <laughs> It's not broken, you know. And, and here's the thing about denial. Here's what I'm really hoping. I know that it's not working the way it should be, but here's, here's what you're really hoping in the, in, the, in the season of denial, that it will fix itself. Has anything ever broken in your house that you just, like, imagine that there's, like, a fairy that lives in your home somewhere, and they're going to just, like, dippity bobbity boop you know? <laughs> and, like, it's working now. Awesome, right? It's like, no, it's not happening like that. Things don't just 
fix themselves. But we, but we believe that until we get to the second stage. The second stage is discouragement or some could say depression. And the reason why we're in this stage is because we finally accept that the thing is broken. But we don't have the money or expertise to fix it. And so here's where it gets dangerous. We decide we're just going to live with it. Ooh. I wonder if there's anybody here. Something's been broken in your life so long, you've just given up fixing on it. You've just accepted that that's the way life's going to be. That can be a problem. And then finally we get to the third stage, but we don't get to the third stage until something happens in the second stage. You know how we're okay in the second stage? We're okay because it's broken, but it's just between me and the thing that's broken. And as long as nobody else can see what's happening, as long as it's not affecting every other area of my life, then I'm okay with living with that broken thing until it begins to affect the other areas of your life. Like when I woke up in the morning one day, I came down the stairs and, the, and it had leaked so much that the water had actually poured out and had gotten all over the laminate floor. Laminate, if you don't know, is like what people buy when they can't afford real wood or tile floors. <laughs> now the problem with laminate is that when it gets wet, it bubbles and it lifts. And so now I'm like, I'm fixing this thing. And here's the third stage that we get to. First it's denial, then it's depression or discouragement. And the third is desperation. But the only way you get to desperation is when the thing that's broken in your life is beginning to affect other areas of your life. And let me tell you something. If you don't start to deal with that problem, it will leak. It's going to leak into your workplace. It's going to leak into your marriage. It's going to leak into your home. It's going to leak onto your children. It's going to leak into your relationship with God. And then when it finally starts messing up everything, that's when we're like, I got to fix this. And so I went on Google. And I fixed that sink. Somebody give God some praise. <laughs> it's a miracle. I was so proud of myself. My dad's a contractor. I called him up. I was like, I did it. I am your son. <laughs> Fix it, man. It felt so good to finally fix it, but it wasn't until I got to the point of desperation. And this is where fasting comes in, because fasting is unlike any other spiritual discipline. Unlike prayer, unlike sacrifice, unlike giving. Those things were rituals. Hear this about fasting. Fasting was never a ritual. Fasting was always something someone did in the Old Testament in response to a, a need. Something was broken in their life, and they needed God to fix that thing more than they needed food itself. And that's where fasting came in, in a moment of desperation. I want to give you some examples, and maybe you'll be able to resonate with these, and maybe it'll encourage you to get on that fast. David fasted when his baby became terminally ill. A family member is a great reason to fast for. Maybe you're getting desperate over the condition of their life or desperate over the condition of their health. We got a, a woman in our church, Teddy Delgado. We love you. We're praying for you. You're amazing. Give it up for Teddy. You don't know her, but we're praying for you. And you're going to be a part of our fast, and we're believing God's going to do a miracle in your health and in your body. Amen? Fasting for the people you love, that's a good reason to fast. Uh, Moses fasted when he gets out of Egypt, and he's on his way to Mount Sinai, which I think is hilarious. The reason why he fasts is because God delivers him. Like, you got to imagine it. Like, y'all, the Bible is funny. Like, I can't stand when people tell me the Bible's boring. The Bible's not boring. You're boring. The Bible's amazing. The Bible's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing, okay? Like Moses, check this out. He gets delivered from Egypt, okay? All the people get delivered. They're singing songs with the tambourine, you know, the Miriam's playing, you know? They were doing salsa, that's what they were doing, okay? You know? And, and they get to the desert, and all of a sudden the song stops, and Moses goes on a 40-day fast on the top of Mount Sinai. You know why? Because he didn't know what to do next. <laughs> they get delivered, and then they're out there. He's like... There's no signs. There's no, like, blinkers. There's no, there's no, not like the cloud didn't come until after the fast. So there was a cloud that was leading. That wasn't until after the fast. They had nowhere to go. And I think that's a word for somebody who, like, 2018, you just started coming back to church. Like, God's been restoring your life. But now that he's got you here, you don't know where to go next. Direction is a great reason to fast. Guidance. When you're trying to make a big decision, God can help direct you through his power and through his spirit. Ezra fasted over the sin of Israel. Repentance is a good reason to fast. Esther fasted for the Jews who were about to be annihilated. Safety, protection. Maybe you got a loved one who serves in the military. You want to fast for their protection and their safety while they're out there. That's a good reason to fast. Daniel fasted so he wouldn't grow complacent living in Babylon. You know, for a lot of you, it isn't a crisis that's going on in your life. You know what your crisis is? That you've been in the same place for three years spiritually, financially in your life, there's just no movement, and that's not God's plan for your life. Let me be the first person to tell you, when God designs your life, he designs it to be on the advance, on moving forward, taking territory every day of your life. 
And for some of you, you need to go on this fast just to make sure that Babylon doesn't put you to sleep. You break out and grow in your walk with God. But then we get Jesus. After studying Jesus, I figured, I was looking into it, and I'm thinking, you know, what would Jesus fast over? Because, I mean, like, he's Jesus. Like, what could Jesus be desperate about, you know? Like, like you can never scare Jesus. Like, you can never, like, hide around a corner, and Jesus walks around the corner, and you'd be like, boo, and Jesus would be like, ah, he'll know you're there. <laughs> he'll scare you. He'll do, like, a little instant transmission, come on the other side and be like, boo, get you, you know? He'll do it. And so what is Jesus desperate about? But as I saw his fast, I realized that he took desperation when it came to one season of his life. Jesus always entered into a place of desperation whenever he was about to enter into a season of preparation. When it came to preparation, Jesus always engaged in desperation. How do I know this? He goes for a fast 40 days and 40 nights, but before he does it, he does it to get ready for the ministry that he's about to lead. Right before he starts his ministry at the age of 30, he goes on a 40-day fast. What? To prepare for what was coming. Even in this passage, he's fasting. How do we know that Jesus is fasting in Mark chapter 9? Because he says, first of all, he's up there. The mountain of transfiguration just happened. They've been up there for a while, not eating. But when he comes down, he casts out the demon. He says, this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting, which tells us that he's been fasting. Why was he fasting? To prepare preparation, to prepare. Watch this. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. He said to them, this is right after he cast out that demon. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after three days, he will will rise. Can you see it? He's already thinking about what's coming. And because he knows what's coming, the cross, Calvary, he's saying, I got to get ready. I got to get prepared. You need to get prepared for 2019. And let me tell you something about 2019. You don't have to be a prophet to know what's coming. I mean, sure, it would help to have the details, but how many people know you don't need the details to identify the themes? There have been some themes played out in your... If I've known you for the last three years, I can tell you what your next year is going to look like. Because there's themes in your life, patterns that we continue to get in, ways of living that we've yet to shake. And because we've yet to shake them, they're going to repeat themselves and echo themselves into our future. This is, we talked about denial. You know one of the greatest forms of denial I ever hear around the December 31st or January 1st? I always hear, this year is going to be different. This is going to be my year. That's what everybody was saying in 2018. Number eight, year of new beginnings. This is going to be year of new beginnings. Woo, this is going to be my year. Why? Why is it going to be different? Are you going to have the same friends? Then why would it be different? Are you going to work at the same place? So then why would it be different? Are you going to be married to the same person? So, So then why would it be different? And there's somebody here who could probably answer no to all three of those things. <laughs> They'd be like, nope, I'm getting divorced. I quit and I'm moving. <laughs> and to that person, I would ask this question. But are you going to be the same person? Because if you're going to be the same person, then you can expect to have the same year. 2019 isn't going to be different. So it was like, that was really encouraging, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> No, 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 let me encourage you. 2019 has the potential to be different if you choose to do different things. That's what's going to separate it for you. Will you be a different person? Because if you are a different person, 2019 will be the different year that you're claiming it to be. You got to get prepared for this. When you run a race, they don't say go. They say on your mark, get set, go. Go. You're getting ready. And let me tell you something about getting ready for God to do a new thing in your life. If you want to get ready for God to do a new thing in your life, you got to get rid of all the old things the devil's been doing with your life. And when you get rid of the old, you'll make space for the new. Our son, both of them, they're getting a, they got a ton of presents for Christmas. I told you about all the dollar store toys, right? They got a ton, okay? There's a problem with that. My house does not have unlimited space, okay? It's not, it's not like, like the Twilight Zone there. Like you, there's, so we went to our toy cupboard, and Liz told them, listen, you're going to get a lot of toys for Christmas. You're going to have to take all these old toys out in order to make space for these new toys. And so she pulled out a garbage bag, and they had to put everything in there that they didn't want. And now here's the crazy part. They get in there, and they start finding toys they haven't played with in years, They're like, oh my gosh, that's where it's been? (laughs) And then after they grab it, they'd say, that's my favorite toy. I love this toy. I can't live without this toy. You've been living without this toy. It wasn't bringing you any joy. And they would fight with us like six or seven times that happened. 
and they would fight with us. And all the time I'm thinking, you didn't even know it was there. It wasn't bringing you joy. You know, one of our, our, our oppositions to fasting is that, well, I don't like to give up stuff. But what if the stuff you're giving up really isn't giving you joy? Just because you have it doesn't make you happy. You know how many things you have that don't really bring joy into your life? We are short. Listen, I believe that we are a generation. We are a country. We are a nation of people who, who live in a surplus of stuff, but a, sh but a shortage of substance. And here's what I believe. If you give God your stuff, he'll fill you with his substance. You don't need more cars, okay? You don't need more homes. You don't need more toys. You don't need more gadgets, more gizmos. You need more peace, more hope, more joy. And all those things come from God. And if you give up your pride, if you give up your, 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 your hatred, if you give up your bitterness, if you give up your selfishness, if you give up that stuff, that's what fasting is. Fasting is an emptying of yourself so that God can fill you with what's his. The good stuff, the substance stuff. But you got to empty it out first because, because he doesn't fill full cups. Got to empty it out. Got to clear it out. Another thing I love about fasting and what I love about this exercise my wife did with my boys is that not only did it um, allow them to prepare for, for what was coming, but it also gave them perspective. Perspective because, because it had to fit in the bag, see? So they had two toys in their hand, and they had to choose which toy they wanted to live with and, and which toy they had to give up. Or in other words, which toy was important and essential and which toy was not essential. And I love it because that's what fasting does. Fasting gives you perspective in a way where it helps you identify the important and the non-essential things in life. Because when you go without food, something that you could have sworn you needed, and then you end up going without it, all of a sudden you realize, I don't, I don't need as much as I thought I needed. I have enough. You know, there are things in your life you think you need until you don't need it anymore. And then you realize, oh, turns out I never needed that. Like somebody might decide to fast television on these 21 days, right? Even as I said that, I heard somebody curse me out. Right then when I said that, I heard it. Gonna... <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. No. You know what the crazy thing? I didn't think I could either. I love television. The only thing I love more than television is food. Which is why I'm always on the Food Network. Because you get both in one shot. I just love it. I love the cookie shows. I do. I watch them all. Um, I love them. You know what uh, I, I realized about television as I gave it up to hang with my kids? I don't need television. I need my kids. That's right, that's right. And it helped me put television in one bag and my kids in another. Non-essential and important. There's someone here who says, I will never give up social media. I had somebody tell me that last year. Said, I'd rather give up food for 21 days than my social media. They, I was like, you have a problem. <laughs> and I really think this fast is going to help you. <laughs> it provides perspective on what's important. And here's what I realized. Listen, as I... As I as I needed less, I became less needy. You know, the reason why I went on this fast was I was desperate. Our church was not what you see here today. I don't know if anybody was with us in January of 2018, but it was like in the middle somewhere right there. And uh, attendance-wise and people. And I just told my staff, I feel like the Lord's asking us to open up a second service, 11 o'clock, the one you guys are in now. And then 9.30. And, um, and they were like, but there's still more seats. <laughs> And I'm like, but there's people who just, you know, they want to go different. We just want to do it. And then I was desperate. Um, but the Lord showed me through that fast that although God had put that in my heart, you know, because sometimes God can put a purpose in your heart, but then the devil can corrupt that purpose with your selfish motives, you know? And so what I saw that the devil was raising up in me was that I wanted to see the church grow for validation. I wanted to see it for um, to appreciation, to know that everything I had given up was worth something, that I was good at what we were doing here. And the amazing thing happened. As I needed less, I became less needy. God doubled the size of the church at the end of the fast, but even if he hadn't, I'd have been okay because by the time the fast was done, I realized I had enough. I had enough. You know the reason why relationships are always crumbling around you? Because you're needy. And you keep getting things from other people that only God can give you. And when God fills up those voids, you can enter into a relationship and be the giver and the depositor that you were intended to be. But you can't be needy. Fasting will help you not be needy. It'll help you with your security. It'll help you with your confidence. Here's the last thing fasting will do in your life, and it's so important. We see it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. Last thing. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites and some of the Meonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, 
a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon, Hazazon, I don't know. You don't know either, so it don't matter. <laughs> Tamar, verse 3, alarmed Jehoshaphat, resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. If you feel surrounded today, if you feel like the enemies have circled you and there's no way out, he proclaimed the fast for all of Judah. And so the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Verse 9, here's what they said in their prayer. We will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you. Catch this, in our distress. Are you, are, did you catch that? They're desperate. The fast came because they were in distress. They were desperate. In our distress. And look at this faith. And you will hear us and save us. And I love verse 12. For we have no, say with me, power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. Freeze it right here. Really, if you're going to boil down fasting, it really boils down to this. You're in a situation or a position where you feel like you've done all that you can do and you have no more power to incite any other change in your life. You're done. You're at the end of you. You are at a place where you say, like, like the people of Israel say, we do not know what to do. But then look what they say. But our eyes are on you. In other words, they say, we've got to the end of our power, but at the end of our power is where we have discovered a higher power. Here's what fasting will do for you. Here's what putting God first in your life will do for you. Here's what pursuing the Lord will do for you in 2019. If you do it, it will unleash and release God's power into situations you are powerless to impact. He'll do it. God's power, if you depend on him, and if you lean on him, and if you give him those 21 days and tell him, God, I got nowhere to go but you, he'll do it in your life. I want to read a quote to you by A.C. Dixon, a theologian, a scholar, an author. He said this. He said, when we depend upon organizations, we get what organizations can do. When we depend upon education, we get what education can do. When we depend upon man, we get what man can do. But when we depend upon prayer, we get what God can do. We get what God can do. We get what God can do. What God can do. God's got power. Power to do what you are powerless to do. But in order to release his power, you've got to lean on him. I need some help with this illustration. Mike, will you help me out real quick, Michael? Yeah, come on up real quick, man. Come on up real quick. Come on, I need that, that four or five speed that you got. Four, three, four, three. My bad, my bad. Michael, he's playing the NFL, so he's just bragging about how fast he is. Come on inside real quick, Michael. Help me out. And so Michael's going to represent God. It's real important because a lot of you guys have never experienced God's power the way I'm, I'm selling you this. And I want you to know that I'm not selling you this like a person who's never experienced this. I'm telling you this, somebody who God has delivered, somebody who God has healed, somebody who God has set free, somebody who God has... I've, I've, I've been there. And I want you to experience it. But you'll never experience it unless the dynamic of your relationship with Jesus changes. See, a lot of people, hold my hand. A lot of people are in relationship with Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, you're the best. I didn't know Jesus was black. Jesus is black. Jesus is black. black. You're going to be surprised when you get to heaven. I'm just telling you. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, you're the best. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free and, you know, giving me a wife and for being with me. Gosh, I love how much you're with me. And we hold hands with Jesus and we kind of live our life with Jesus. And, and it's cute. It's cute. It's cute. Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Cute. You know, it's cute. And that's cool. Hear me. If all you want to do is experience Jesus' love and Jesus' presence and Jesus' peace, that's cool. This is the only type of relationship you need to have. But if you want to experience his power, your posture has to change. This is great if you want to be cute. Love you, G. You're the best. Awesome. Some of you guys have been living that way for a long time. You get to experience the supernatural power. You get to, here's why. 
because you haven't leaned on him. You're holding his hand, but you haven't leaned on him. Things change when your posture changes. You ready? We didn't get to practice this beforehand, so. You ready? If you want to experience God's power, you can't just hold his hand, kiss him, hug him. If you want to experience God's power, you got to run to him. Hey, listen to me. They always told me God was strong, but it wasn't until he carried me. It wasn't until he picked me up. It wasn't until I leaned on him. It wasn't until I put my problems on him, my burden on him, my weight on him, my sickness on him, my cancer on him, my poverty on him, my bankruptcy on him, my divorce on him, my death on him, my end on him, my weight on him. Then I felt his power. Then I experienced his strength. Stop being cute. Run to Jesus. Run to him and lean on him. Lean on him. Throw all your burdens on me, says the Lord. I can pick you up. I can carry you. You want to experience his power? Lean on him. All of yourself. Abandon yourself. Now here's the thing. I didn't know if he'd pick me up. Because it takes faith to jump. It takes faith to run. It takes faith to be caught. But hey, why not? You've been trying to do it with your works. And your works weren't working. This isn't working. So let's try it with Jesus. Let's jump on him. Let's put our life on him. This is what fasting is. It's eliminating every distraction from your life and say, my weight is on you. Stay standing, stay standing. somebody here today you've been in the middle with your relationship with God but today you want to throw yourself on him all of you maybe you've never had a relationship with him before let's give those people a moment of privacy every head by every eye closed right here right now if you're in this room and you're getting ready you you just have never had that relationship with Christ before you've never made a decision to follow him or you did at one point in your life but today you want to give him yourself completely when I say three, I want you to raise your hand. I need Jesus in my heart. I need Jesus in my life. If that's you, when I say three, I need you to raise your hand as a sign and a signal. All over this place, you need Jesus in your heart. You need him in your life. One, two, three. Right now, come on, don't you be ashamed. Don't you be afraid. You need this. Come on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Come on. Let's pray this prayer together, church. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, I've been trying to do it on my own, but it's not working. Today, I throw my life in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give it up. 13 people. Hey, I want to say thank you again for taking the time to watch our YouTube video. I want to encourage you to do two things, share and subscribe. We want you to share this video with your friends and family so you can bring encouragement directly to them. And we want you to subscribe so that you're sure you don't miss out. Thanks again.